Welcome back, party people. Happy Easter. I hope all is well. Uh, I was supposed to, uh, I was supposed to talk at one of our um, sat songs today, but being that it was Easter, our film guy didn't uh, wasn't able to show up. So I figured I'd record a nice little Q and A for everybody because there were some Q and As from the last, some questions from the last, uh, you know, podcast or wherever the hell this is that we're doing, and just check up on the city. There are some buildings that are crumbling. You know, the city is failing. My factories are running out of Omega. Too much crime. Yeah, lots of crime with the casinos coming. I don't know if this... I mean, it is... It's gradually failing, but... Ooh, you need oil. All right. Well, I'll probably build some more Omega stuff. I started with the drones. So I'm going to keep going with the drones. The garbage dumps are all... These are all overfilling because when you do drones, the creates so much garbage. Eventually, these towers are going to collapse. I wonder though if the towers will stay good. This one not so much, but if the other towers will stay pretty healthy as the normal buildings fall, we'll take a look. So I'll probably just do a little bit more Omega. I might take out some of these casinos because they're really not doing anything for us. And uh, I hope everyone enjoys, you know, some of the stuff we cover is like the Dark Knight of the Soul. Had some questions to expound upon that. Um, did a really nice meditation in the beginning. Hope everyone enjoys that. And just some stuff about loving awareness, spiritual practice. So I hope everyone enjoys and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Namaste. Hello again. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to meet you again in the here and now. I'd like to share with you a meditation from one of the masters of mindfulness, Buddhism, whatever. Um, Joseph Goldstein, I'd highly recommend you look him up. He's probably, well, I call him a technician and an artist. I think he's, he's the best, uh, Buddhist translator or repeater and explainer of these ancient words and texts that they have. And uh, just like to share this meditation I found from him, which I, which I liked. So, first, take a comfortable but alert posture, whatever that may be. Generally, we keep our eyes closed, but you can keep them slightly open if you'd like. And begin by taking a few deep breaths. Don't be afraid to really breathe deeply two or three times. And simply settle into the awareness of the body. Let the breath find its natural rhythm. Remember, this is not a breathing exercise. It's an exercise in awareness. Just sit and know you're sitting, feeling the body posture, a phrase that many people have found helpful is, there is a body. So just intermittently repeat that phrase. There is a body. 
and gently settle into the awareness of the body sitting. Within the framework, a larger framework, there's a body. You may become aware of the sensations of the body breathing. There's no need to narrow the attention necessarily on the feeling of the breath, although one can do that, but often people find it more easeful to keep the larger context of the whole body sitting. And simply be aware of the sensations of the body breathing within that larger framework. There is a body. Become aware of the body breathing. You can also feel any other sensations that may appear and call your attention. As you feel the different sensations in the body, notice what happens to them as you become aware. Notice whether they're changing in some way. Stay alert for the appearance of any thoughts or appearances in the mind. Simply become aware that the mind is thinking, or if it's an image, seeing. And notice what happens to the thought as you become aware of it. There is a body. Aware of the sensations of the body breathing. Mindful of other sensations that call your attention. Notice their changing nature. And stay alert of any thoughts or images that arise in the mind. Sometimes a soft mental note of thinking or seeing helps to strengthen the mindfulness of them. can also settle back into a very spacious awareness, become aware of any sounds that are arising. Staying grounded in the awareness of the body. Aware of any aspect of experience that becomes predominant and calls our attention. can suffuse the whole field of mindfulness with the feeling of loving-kindness. 
friendliness towards our own experience and while wishing for others. May all beings be at peace. you found as much enjoyment out of that there's a few questions that came up from the last talk I would like to address First question. Is. What is the dark night of the soul? And that's night with N-I-G-H-T. Um. I think that I've experienced the dark night of the soul prior to really becoming conscious of what the meaning behind that is. It's a shared experience that people on the spiritual path have encountered. mystic and spiritual teacher, Mirabai Star, M-I-R-A-B-A-I-S-T-A-R-R, has done some really <clears throat> great work at bringing this concept into a Western perspective that's digestible, at least for me. I was raised in America, so there you go. And so I'm going to just kind of describe this coming from some of her teachings. Originally, this was a concept formed from St. John of the Cross, who's a 16th century Spanish mystic. And we can start to understand this by exploring the experience, if you've had it, or maybe just this concept, that everything that, well, sometimes when people start a spiritual practice or <clears throat> start to become aware of this spiritual thing, let's say getting close with God or whatever you want to say it, um, they start to have different feelings, different sensations, physical sensations. It kind of feels like you're high, like you're getting stoned or you're a little bit altered. You're just like, it's what I feel like right now, actually. And I haven't taken any drugs. And that can hook people, you know, that's a good feeling, and it keeps some people coming back and back to the spiritual practice. And sometimes those things that got us high on the spiritual practice can start to feel a bit dry. And if you start to surrender to that dryness, that blondness, it can take you deeper. 
and all the concepts and belief systems that were built up start to fade away. And that's, and then basically once those fade away, all that's left is just this darkness or this void. This falling away experience leaves one with a longing for a union with God. And to deal with this, we just allow ourselves to not know. And in that not knowing or that unknown is where that is actually where God resigns. It's, you know, if people, certain people are comfortable with different analogies. You know, some people say, oh, God is light. And I'm not even, when I say God, I'm not, speak, you know, strictly speaking of a Christian God. It's whatever spiritual connection to a higher power, higher being, something outside of yourself exists, or just simply an unknown. Anything that is not knowable, we'll just say that that's God. And if that triggers you, let it trigger you, just deal with that. And so this allowing ourselves to not know and allowing this unknown spaciousness to cradle you and sit in that where maybe it used to be light. It could be, it could have been light. It could be an immense saturation, overwhelming light that overtakes and embodies your experience. Whether it's light or darkness, it's the same because at that moment, there is no other. If you have light without darkness, it's just complete light. There is no concept of light. There is just that. And same with darkness or void. But we can use that concept of darkness or void more as a way <clears throat> to describe this sensation than we can use light, because light is the opposite. So this Spanish mystic, St. John of the Cross, has an interesting analogy master painter analogy you know that there's an incredible artist and all of us as individuals are his most beautiful creations and the master artist wants to paint their portrait so we as individuals agree to this we agree to sit and let them paint us. And in the sitting, eventually we start to think, you know, how can I make this better? Maybe could I get in a different posture? Maybe I'll go get some new colors. How can we engage to help? But any engagement hurts that process. So we need to be still and let that process unfold. And in that stillness, in this unfoldment, the radiance of what is, is what we perceive as the dark night of the soul. I hope that helps explain that a little bit better. Next question, what does loving awareness mean when you are grieving a death or broken heart 
and you don't care much about life in that moment, how do I move forward? Mm. I think that ties in really well to the first question <clears throat> because that radiant, overwhelming light that we can often feel on this path in this union with our higher spiritual whatever it's it it can go it can feel like it's left when some bad stuff happens enter the dark night of the soul so what does loving awareness mean in that context when you are grieving you have a broken heart Again, I would, uh, you got to read Mirror by a Star or listen to her. I mean, she, that's basically her deal. But how I look at it as the next step, <clears throat> the next step out of <clears throat> the dark night of the soul would be loving awareness. That's just taking the next step. Because once we rest and settle in the unknowing and unfolding we find that there's a relationship with everything that's happened and that relationship is either void nothingness darkness or it's loving awareness. It's your choice. Loving awareness is how to be in the worlds of suffering. The mind, the thinking, the doing, the I should or I must is that individual ha thinking that they can do something to kind of help make their portrait better instead of just sitting and letting themselves be drawn. And you start thinking, oh, maybe, <clears throat> maybe it would be better if my loved one was here or if I was with my partner still, if my child wouldn't have died so early, this, it would just be a better picture of me. Those are thoughts. Your relationship to the thoughts <clears throat> is loving awareness. And when in thoughts become overwhelming, just sit in the unrationality of it. It's, it's irrational to have the loss of a child. It's you know, for so many people, that's just a myth, you know, like my children won't leave me before I, you know, the, there's, they're not going to leave me. I leave them. And then once that happens, it's irrational. How is that logical? It's because any thought process that you have will change. It's in a context or a framework of um, the mind and the nature of the mind is constant change. It's like being in the position of 
your beingness in time. Time is a constant moving. It will always keep moving. And your beingness is always changing. Your body is always changing. The environment's changing. The one constant is time is always moving forward. And when we can sit in between the concepts of changing, we can start to form that relationship with the concepts. And how are you going to be? How are you going to be in the world? Loving awareness. Ram Das, so beautiful, says, I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness. Over and you dissolve in between any logical, any perception, anything that could ever arise. You just dissolve and those things that arise are now inside of you and then even that inside outside dissolves and you just become I am I it's a beautiful thing so how do you move forward just move forward with loving awareness realize you don't have to do anything Nothing has to be a certain way. But when you're still and you're silent and it feels right, then take that next step out of the dark night and into loving awareness. Because that's all there is. That's the only place we can go. Oh, my heart's with you, though. What did you mean when you said you have a spiritual practice? What actions? How often? Well, that's another good question. And I think that is also tied into the rest of these questions, which I'm not sure if I touched on it, but the, the purpose of developing a spiritual practice is to have at least a path form in your consciousness towards loving awareness or just being okay when bad things start to happen. When you start to become confused, you don't understand your suffering, your pain, and you're lost. And you come back to where that spiritual practice has been taking you this whole time. And so you can do many things to practice. You can sit and meditate like we did in the beginning. You can chant. I love chanting. You can it's just very simply the word Ram, 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 Ram. Um, just do that just in your head or out loud just ram 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 you know you can do that while you're sitting waiting in a doctor's office for your test results to come back when you're at the grocery store and you know you're just sitting in line while people are taking their their precious time talking to the cashier or finding their pennies in order to make the exact change. You just ram, ram, ram. You could do that sitting in your room for the next four hours. Just sit there and chant Ram. 
And when you notice things start to come up, your thoughts start to drift, just gently, with compassion and kindness, bring your attention back to the words, back to the word, Ram, Ram, Ram. Uh, they say that you should do a spiritual practice first thing in the morning. That's the best. And the second best time to do it is any other time during the day. You know, if you want, I mean, there's so many things. You can do yoga, <clears throat> you can do jujitsu, martial arts, um, you can ride your bike. Anything to give yourself a break from the constant mind stuff that goes on. Society isn't going to cradle you. You know, they're not going to be a gentle mother. You know, holding you and rubbing your head and singing you goodnight. Society is is going to try and make you into some sort of machine, which is okay. You know, being a machine and doing stuff, getting stuff done is great. But that spiritual practice allows you to connect to something transcendent, not just beyond what society tells you, but beyond what you've been conditioned to tell yourself. And those are important things. Because eventually everything's going to be wiped away. And all that's left is this. And how are you with this? Let's practice being good with this. And with that, I'll bid you a farewell. I hope that your hearts stay open and I wish you an absolutely wonderful day. Ram Ram.